Hi everyone, thanks for coming uh, to this Nature Careers webcast and working from home as an early career researcher during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I very much hope it's useful and informative for you. This is just a quick pre-recorded message to talk you through this session. Uh, first of all, hi, I'm Jack. I'm one of the careers editors here at Nature and I'll be moderating the three talks you hear today from, uh, from our different speakers, as well as the live question and answer session that will follow those talks. Um, the talk I'll give way to first in just a moment comes from Atma Ivanchevich at the University of Colorado Boulder, who um, talked talk through her, her lockdown experience and her lockdown diary and how she's trying to find balance in working from home during this period. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Melina papalabrapoulou Tsiridou from Laval University in Canada to talk about her journey in finding motivation working from home as an early career researcher. Uh, finally, just before the Q&A session, we'll hear from Sarah Blackford. Um, she runs a website called biosciencecareers.org um, and she'll give us some sort of career counselling advice uh, and some more formal models um, when it comes to learning how to work from home effectively. So that's that's it, that's the webcast. Um, after that, we'll, we'll open up to a question and answer session. Um, if you have any questions for us during that session, please do feel free to, to ask them now, or you can ask them as we open up live. Um, to ask a question now, just at any point when you think of one, type, there's an ask a question button somewhere on this webpage. Uh, you can just type in your question there and we'll run through them at the end once we all go live. Um, thank you so, so much for joining and we're, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So without further ado, here's Atma's talk on how she's found the lockdown from Colorado. Hi everyone, I'm Atma. I'm a postdoc at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I study retroviruses and how they might be involved in human diseases. Most of the time I work on a computer with a little bit of lab work. Recently, due to the coronavirus pandemic, I've been working completely from home. I've been asked to share my experiences as a work from home scientist. Of course, everyone's experiences are different. Mine have been heavily influenced by the fact that I am an international postdoc working in the United States, while my family and friends are mostly in Australia or Europe. When the lockdown first started, I started keeping a diary as a way of writing everything down, even if I wasn't fully processing it yet. So I thought I'd go through the last 10 weeks in chronological order to show some of the ups and downs that many of us are going through. My university issued a stay at home order for all employees in the middle of March. In less than a week, we went from business as usual with experiments and meetings to a statewide lockdown where we were told to avoid socialising at all costs and stay at home. The first thing I felt was shock and a lot of confusion. As a lab, we talked about the possibility of a lockdown, but none of us expected it to happen so fast or to be so extreme. That week we had our first virtual lab meeting where we all downloaded Zoom and tried to talk about what this would mean for the lab, for our projects and how to stay in touch with each other. Most importantly, my PI said that right now our health and well-being is so much more important than any research. That week I also had a commentary article that I'd been invited to write that was due the following Monday. So even as all of this was going on in the background, I needed to write this article ASAP so I could distance myself from everything else a little bit. My second week of lockdown was similar in the sense that I had something work-related that I needed to get done. It was my turn to present lab meeting coming up and I was too overwhelmed probably with everything going on to pick a research summary presentation so instead I chose to do a journal club paper. As a compromise, I picked a heavily experimental paper, which was out of my comfort zone. And this was good in the sense that it took me a whole week to understand the mouse models and ZDNA that they were talking about. So I was busy. But this was also the week that a lot of countries started enforcing travel bans. For example, Australia started calling all overseas nationals to come home. 
My family, of course, would have loved me to come home so that I wouldn't be here by myself. But there were a lot of other factors I had to think about. I've been in the States for more than a year now, so that's long enough to have started building up a life here with friends and a support system and a project that I didn't want to leave. Going home would also mean traveling through three major international airports, such as Sydney, Denver, and LA, and traveling for more than 24 hours, which seemed risky amid the whole coronavirus situation. I also had a cold at the time, which was mild with a little bit of a fever and a runny nose, but I didn't know if they'd be temperature checking at airports or even if it was socially responsible to go through crowded places right now. Um, it got to the point where it was so hard for me to make any kind of decision that because I was making this really big one that I couldn't even decide what to bring for a happy hour as a quarantini. So to that end, I ended up getting one of those algorithm based wine clubs to choose wine for me and deliver it straight to my door so that that at least would be easy. And in terms of staying or going, I decided to stay. My main recollection from week three was the sheer amount of awkwardness associated with virtual meetings. It was my turn to present lab meetings, so I presented my virtual journal club. And of course, I spent way too long figuring out how to share my screen, where to put everyone's faces so they went on top of my slides, where to look at the camera or at my slides or at everyone else's reactions. It just felt really disconnected. This week was also the week where we had our first institute-wide virtual collaboration, sorry, collaboration, where we were encouraged to bring costumes or have a customized virtual background and listen to two talks, one about coronavirus mathematical modeling and the other one about grad student support. This was my first big Zoom of more than 20 or 30 people, but it was just as awkward because Zoom meetings, only one person can talk at a time, and there are many silences. Also, at the end of it, everyone applauds silently and then logs out, and you realize you're sitting in a dark room by yourself, drinking. Which is fine, but in my case, that just made the isolation feel even worse. This week was also the one where I realized I needed to have a proper work set up. I couldn't just work on my laptop hunched over in bed all the time, so I got myself a work desk, a computer chair, and I brought, well, my lab manager Dave brought my external monitor home from work for me, which made a huge difference. By week four, we discovered Snap Camera, which is an app that lets you become a virtual vegetable. We discovered this because my PI showed up to lab meeting as a potato. And you can tell that not much else was going on because this was the highlight of my week. We also talked about our quarantine goals, such as maybe picking up a new computational skill and whether we could repurpose some of the projects in our lab to work on coronavirus instead. It was honestly such an optimistic lab meeting because we were trying to figure out ways that we could best use this quarantine time. This was also the week that I think all of the residents of Boulder reached their breaking point because at 8 p.m. every night, they would start howling like wolves and clanging pots and pans. It was a bit eerie to start off with, but I have to say, it's a great way to release a whole bunch of pent up frustration from the day. Week five was one of the hardest weeks for me personally. It was the week that I realized that our current situation might not be short term. I could very well be working from home until there is a coronavirus vaccine available. It was also the first week where I didn't have any urgent work deadline or presentation or big decision to make. So I had a lot more free time and I started using that time to read the news a lot more which then made it seem ridiculous to try to work. It was like 
a turning point in my work from home life. The previous week of optimism and quarantine goals now seemed a bit unrealistic because how could I work on a coronavirus project if I couldn't even focus on my own research? It was a week of a lot of walks and hikes. I don't know if I did a single day of work. It was a lot of doubt and guilt because I wasn't working. And I know it's normal to not be productive in a pandemic. I've been told that so many times, but it's different to not be able to do something or make yourself do anything for a whole day. The next few weeks were a realization that things weren't going to be as easy as I had hoped. Instead of helping the world with new coronavirus research, I can barely focus on one task a day. Zoom meetings are also just much more draining than in-person meetings. I'm lucky in that I only have two or three lab-related meetings each week, but the problem is that everything is on Zoom now, including coffee catch-ups, happy hours, times to see friends, and it just gets tiring staring at a screen. It got to the point where I just needed to turn all of my notifications off for a while to have a break. By week seven, I'd accepted that I needed to rethink how much I could get done every day and make an adjusted work routine. Originally, I was planning to have a paper out this year. Now I needed to reevaluate the types of analysis that would have to change and whether that was still possible. The main things that helped me were scheduling work hours into my calendar and at the same time every day, such as before or after lunch. Also, not watching TV while I work. This is something I never would have done in the lab, but when you're at home, there's much less accountability and it's hard to resist having something on in the background, even if it's just to generate some background noise. Over the last few weeks, as I've been adjusting to work from home life, I've also had the opportunity to see how other people are dealing with it. For example, some of my lab mates have taken up listening to podcasts about coronavirus and are now using that to influence their research. Or other lab mates are playing around with a supercomputer and running their first programs. I think it's interesting to see the different coping strategies that are emerging, and it's honestly inspiring anytime someone achieves something, even if it's something small or it's slower than they hoped for. Right now, we're preparing for phase one, which means a slow return to work at limited capacity, where we have extra precautions such as temperature sensing and shift work schedules. As a computational person, I'm still gonna be working from home for the foreseeable future. These last 10 weeks of lockdown have taught me that I need to be realistic about how much I can get done every day and what the rest of the year will look like. But it's also taught me that we are adapting both individually and as a scientific community, even if we don't realize that we are. Thank you for letting me share my experiences. I'd like to thank my lab, especially for being so supportive during this time. If you'd like to reach out, feel free to contact me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or email. And most, most importantly, stay safe. Thank you, Atma, very much for that talk. If anyone's got any questions for Atma, we'll come to them at the end of, uh, of this pre-recorded talk session. Uh, please do just go to the Ask a Question box somewhere on this webpage and type in your question there. Uh, first of all, here's Melina's presentation on finding motivation as an early career researcher. Hello, everyone. My name is Melina, and I am a PhD MBA candidate at Université Laval. I'm doing my PhD in neuroscience at Servo Brain Research Center, and I'm here with you today in order to share my experience about how I managed to find motivation when I did so during these tough times. If you're just a bit like me, meaning a control freak and a stress ball, then you have definitely wondered what the hell is happening or what the hell am I doing? Atma in the previous session perfectly described the ups and downs of the lockdown process and like Atma, I have also experienced a very emotional journey during the last 10 weeks. Finding and maintaining motivation is a really tough task to start with. 
The fact that I have been diagnosed with chronic stress and anxiety did not help, of course. And it's the same for so many PhD students all over the world who also experience poor mental health. In addition, I'm really away from my family who are back in Greece and I'm constantly concerned about their health and safety. I can only imagine that for a lot of PhD students all over the world, the current situation must be even harder due to financial reasons. Well, it's not a secret that PhDs, well, we are not that well paid. And on top of that, some TA and fixed term contract positions that are normally performed by PhDs have been cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, a lot of my friends have also been extremely insecure and concerned about the legal immigration status in the countries of their study, adding more stress in the already stressful situation. The reality of working from home hit me so hard that for the first two days I was in shock. I had to figure out in a very limited amount of time all the technicalities, meaning how to connect remotely to my lab desktop in order to be able to access programs I needed and how to be able to access my data from our lab server. Luckily for that part, I had a lot of help and support from the technicians in my team. Once this part was done, I had to figure out, okay, how do we separate the apartment with my partner? How to stay motivated during this whole time? How to stay productive and effective during this whole time? How to stay in touch with my friends? How to stay in touch with my collaborators? This in my head was a huge mountain that I suddenly and without any preparation had to climb. This whole process for me has been a trial and error, but it got so much easier once I figured out where to start from. The first thing I did was to go on Google and search how people are staying motivated while working from home. So I started reading blogs and articles from professionals that are working from home and are doing so successfully. While I was uh, noting tips and tricks from them, I was listening to TEDx talks to get inspired and motivated, thinking, if they can do it, so can I. One of my favorite TEDx talks is the one from Scott Geller about the psychology of self-motivation. This one really talked to me and every time I feel a bit down, I go back to it. The last part I did was to connect with friends from all over the world. A lot of us are currently in the same boat and this helps exchange information. So I was trying to absorb as many things as I could do and then through the trial and error pro process, I was trying to figure out what suits my personality, my schedule and the life I have built. I have not yet worked out everything, but I will be sharing with you a few tips that I found easy to follow and easy to apply. Among all my readings, I found three ideas that were very common and were basically based on the fact that as humans, well, we're creatures of habit. Of habit. The first one is relating with setting up a work routine. I personally try to maintain the exact work schedule I have when I was going to the lab. I was going to bed the same time and I was waking up the exact same time. Of course, I embraced all the flexibility working from home brings and I was pressing this snooze button a few times if I felt that I needed this extra time, but I was making sure that I had set a certain number of hours to work per day. The second tip was to get dressed. I personally found that this one affected a lot my personal and professional confidence. I stopped wearing my PJs when I was about to start working from home and I switched to wearing clothes and this helped a lot for me to tune into the appropriate work mode. The third tip is with having a designated workspace. Now I know that might be a bit more complicated for those of you staying with your partner, flatmates or kids, but it's really important because it sends a clear message to the rest of the people living in the same house or flat that you are working and they should try not to disturb you. Setting a place for work helped me a lot in order to maintain this mental switch from home to work and then back home when my work day was over. The last idea is related with applying positivity in the way you communicate with your family, friends, collaborators, co-workers or supervisor. The way you feel about working from home is reflected on the way you communicate and vice versa. In a working from home world, meetings are replaced by Zoom and personal conversations are replaced by Skype chats or even instant messaging. 
So for example, are you say, I will never be able to complete this task, or like everyone else, I will have to adapt to the new reality, but I'm going to give it my best shot. If you are using something similar to the second approach, you are empowering yourself and on top of that, you are building a stronger foundation for positive reinforcement and managing expectations. The second set of ideas is a bit more personal and it includes a bit of self-exploration. Through this process, I managed to find out what really motivates me and apply daily doses of motivators in my work life. Finding what really motivates you is a very essential part because applying the wrong motivators won't give you any incentives. Imagine, for example, hanging a fish in front of a horse and expecting the horse to run faster. This will not happen because horses generally do not like fish. On the other hand, hanging a carrot will give the horse the appropriate incentive to perform better because carrots are delicacy for, for them. Applying the right motivators in my work routine helped me complete tasks that I found boring or, to be honest, a bit repetitive. The second idea is related with exercising. This part has been extremely challenging for me because I was never known to be a very physically active person. However, I know that exercise will help me boost my energy and productivity levels, improve my, st my sleep quality and also release some stress and produce some endorphins. For one more time, I turned to my friends in order to ask for help. So what we did was to create virtual yoga dates in order to exercise all together and have a bit of fun as well. This helped a lot since I was able to do a bit of yoga and exercise three to four times per week. The third tip that helped me a lot was to realize how important it is to celebrate small steps and small victories, no matter if it was just a finishing of an online week course or finishing that part of the introduction. I made sure to reward myself no matter the size of this victory. This small win strategy will help you as well take a huge problem, divide it in smaller pieces and reward yourself all the way to completion. It will keep you motivated and it will keep you positive towards accomplishing your final task. I have already mentioned how important it was for me to stay in touch with my friends and colleagues. We are all in the same boat, but we are dealing with the current situation in so many different ways. So taking all these ideas helped me improve how I work from home. My friends and colleagues have been a great resource of inspiration and motivation. And I would recommend you to turn to them whenever you feel that you need support and help. For example, with a really close friend of mine and fellow PhD candidate in my lab, we ended up being accountability partners, meaning that we once per week we are having a meeting and we are setting our weekly and monthly goals. This helps both of us stay motivated and be sure that we complete our tasks. And this is Isabel and I, after our last accountability check-in. I have also written an article about how to find motivation as a PhD student during COVID-19 pandemic that was published at Nature Career Column. Feel free to check it out. Under the current circumstances, it's really important that we all take time to process what is happening. We are not just PhD students. We are friends, we are partners, we are parents, we are someone else's kids. So no matter what we're feeling, it's okay. Even if this is happiness for our success, guilt for feeling happy, worry about our family and our future, it's okay. I have been trying to embrace everything I am feeling and trying very, very hard not to compare myself or, or my progress with anyone else's. Use this time to invest in yourself. Even if this is by doing online courses or developing your LinkedIn profile or even networking. If one day you don't feel like reading a scientific article, it's fine, just read a book. If you don't want to sit down for eight hours to do analysis, it's fine. You can take instead a virtual museum tour. Do whatever will make you feel better. I hope you're enjoying this webcast session as much as we do. Stay home and stay safe. Take care and feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Thanks, Melina. 
Uh, for those of you listening at home who want to ask a question, please just type in your questions in the box. Uh, it should be somewhere on this web page and we'll get to them during the live session uh, at the end of the next talk. Uh, speaking of the next talk, here is Sarah Blackford, um, who's going to talk through some sort of career counselling methods that will come in handy when working from home. Hello everyone, um, my name is Sarah Blackford, I'm a PhD careers advisor and coach um, and um, I'd like to thank Nature Careers for inviting me to take part in this webinar today. Um, I was very interested to hear about Atma and Melina's um, approaches to coping with adversity and adapting to their own situations and they've given some really good examples of how you can think of your own strategies and in your own situations with your own uh, personality and the way that you uh, ordinarily organize your lives. Um, so I thought um, my time would be best spent giving you a couple of approaches that might help you to self-coach your way uh, through this situation to devise your own strategies. Um, I saw this um, quote many years ago, but it's very, very poignant now. Um, uncertainty is the only certainty that is, and knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security. So we're in unprecedented times at the moment, but change is happening all the time, and it's been happening over the last decades, and will continue to do so. So whatever coping mechanisms that you're using now, this will put you in good bed for the future as well. Um, now adversity ordinarily um, can cause stress and that gives rise to negative thoughts and behaviours and that may then impact on your ability to actually uh, run your life to feel positive about uh, going forward. So um, the cycle usually works like this. So you have the environment. The environment is causing you um, the stress, the adversity, and this gives rise to thoughts and beliefs in your head, which then in turn affects your mood and your behavior and then your physiology. And so this can be a circular cycle that goes round and round and perhaps is uh, very unhelpful to you. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you um, a way to adapt to your environment, because if we can't change our environment, we ourselves have got to adapt to it and build our own resilience. So how are you going to do this? So the two coaching techniques that I'm going to um, talk about today is the ABCDE framework, which was uh, devised and uh, I've referenced uh, Steve Sheward and Rena Branch here, and also the GROW model, which was proposed by John Whitmore. So uh, in a way, it's not important to know those uh, things, but uh, it just gives some background if you want to look up. Uh, things in more detail. So let's just focus first on the ABCDE framework. Um, so this stands for A, the activating of the adverse event. B is the belief or your thoughts about the situation. And then C, the resulting consequential behavior. And that is sort of the, the negative side in a sense, that that is the adverse um, situation and the adverse beliefs and consequences that might arise from that. DE is a more positive part of the framework in that this is trying to help you out of the situation. And so to uh, dispute and dispel some of these unhelpful beliefs and thoughts, and then to reflect some new positive thinking that then impacts and impacts leads to improved emotional and physical well-being. So that obviously is the, um, the job of a coach, a professional coach who will help you to do that. Um, but there are ways in which you can help yourself to do this or perhaps even talking to a friend. It's not a perfect situation, but at least it gives you a framework to work with. So 
examples of activating adverse events. Now, in the past, I might have used, um, say, for example, I might have come across somebody who has got a job interview coming up and is basically feeling very negative about it, perhaps very nervous, or um, they've got a conference presentation, which, again, you know, they need to sort of think more positively about it to be more confident. Um, but other people um, have had to um, endure illness. I know someone who had a fire in his department, which put him out of the um, lab for over six months. So he had to uh, cope with that. And now, of course, we've got the COVID induced working from home, which is uh, presenting its own set of challenges. And so the beliefs and thoughts that can arise from these adverse situations can vary. And obviously, it depends on your um, own way of uh, looking at things. but. Uh, for example, you're worried if there's a conference presentation or a job interview coming up that maybe your mind will go blank or they're going to ask you difficult questions. Uh, but now in the working from home in the COVID situation and being away from the lab, people are worrying about are they going to be able to finish their PhD or they're not being able to cope with the situation or thinking I'll be forgotten and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll not be able to uh, get on with my research when I get back to the lab. And so this creates feelings of anxiety and that can also cause um, lethargy and being demotivated. As Melina was saying, you know, not wanting to get out of bed or not wanting to put on your clothes and, you know, fe feeling sort of that you're going nowhere. Um, Self-defeating thoughts and, and maybe cutting yourself off from other people and sort of uh, withdrawing inside yourself. And then this can also uh, create situations where you're not eating properly or you're not sleeping, and generally not looking after yourself. So, so these, as I said, are the more negative sides, and this is how somebody might present themselves to me as a coach. And so what we need to do is go about trying to dispel some of those really unhelpful thoughts, which aren't going to change the situation and not going to make life better for you. How are you going to get around that? What sort of things can you do? And so it's about challenging these beliefs and these thoughts and trying to really think your way out of the situation. So are you thinking, for example, that only the worst things that can happen? So this is sort of catastrophizing and really uh, just focusing on the negative. Um, maybe you're thinking in black and white, only the extreme of what might happen and not thinking of any sort of gray areas or compromises. Um, trying to predict or not trying to, but predicting a bad future for yourself. Um, really, that fits in with catastrophizing and then focusing only on the negative without even considering um, the positive aspects. So this might be happening to you um, about some areas of your life and then not about others. But just to um, then take that to uh, the final stage of the framework, um, effecting new and positive thinking. So trying to step outside of yourself and observe these negative beliefs and thoughts and recognizing them and actually then being able to challenge yourself about the way that you're thinking and acting. So what evidence do you have for these current beliefs? What's really happening? If you were in your friend's situation, what would you advise them? If they were in your position now, what would you be telling them? And what's the worst that could happen? You know, consider what is the worst that could happen and, and how would you get out of that situation? And then, you know, what is a more helpful way to then handle, to look at this situation? Um, so then this leads me on to the second um, self-coaching approach, which is using the GROW model. And so the GROW model stands for goal, reality, options, and will. So what do you want to achieve? What's your goal? What is the current situation that you're in? What can you do about it? And then what will you do about it? So here are some examples. So starting in the top left-hand side, here's an example. 
So choose something, a barrier that is creating difficulties for you right now. What can you think of that would be helpful to change in the way that you're thinking right now? So reflect on what's currently happening in the context of this difficult barrier. So what's the reality of your situation right now? What's, what's happening to you? How are you reacting to this? And then consider the options that you have to improve your situation. So there may be lots of things you could do to change things. And then finally, what will you do? What out of your options do you want to prioritize? Maybe you can't do all of those things. It's too overwhelming to try to do all of those things. So focus in on one or two small things that you can do to improve your situation. So I have some, an, uh, one example here. So uh, top left-hand corner, I want to make progress with my research, even though I can't get into the lab. So at the moment, I'm feeling completely demotivated. I'm having problems focusing on my data and getting on with the analysis. So perhaps doing alternative tasks and avoiding doing the thing you know you need to do. What can I do? Well, I think there's a postdoc in the lab who might be able to help me. And I've also heard if you post questions onto ResearchGate that uh, you might get help that way. And maybe I could go on a course to help me to um, improve my data analysis and find out new ways to, to look at the problem. So out of all those things, what do I think would be most helpful for me? Well, I think I'll email the postdoc in my lab first and foremost and see what she thinks. And she may have some other ideas as well to help me. And maybe I'll try and set up a more of a routine timetable for myself that will help me to stay more focused. So that's just one example. You'll have your own examples. And so let's just um, uh, look at this uh, in more broad terms now. So this maps very well onto the idea of uh, spending some time reflecting on your situation, thinking it through, maybe writing things down, and then taking action. So in the reflection stages, reflect, write down what's happening, you know, write it on a piece of paper and then you can look at it, you can chart your feelings and, you know, scrutinize them more closely. Take the shoulds and orcs out of your thoughts. So these can sometimes be unhelpful if you're really being hard on yourself. And reflect how you've got through adverse times in the past. As PhD students and postdocs, um, inevitably, you're always problem solving, always thinking of new ways to do things. And consider what is achievable. So don't try to overwhelm yourself with too many options. So aim to achieve some wins. So these might be quick wins, things that you can feel that you can tick those off, that you've done that task. So it might be writing or data analysis. It could be something addressing your career. Um, do something that you enjoy that energizes you. So this could be exercise, but it could also be baking or watching your favorite films. It could be going out cycling. Try to communicate. This is really important. As I said right at the beginning, you might be withdrawing and um, not uh, looking and reaching out for help and support. Um, this could be with the people that you know in your lab, your supervisor, in your department, your colleagues, and so on. Um, but also, if you reach out using social media, and as Atma and Melina identified, um, things like uh, looking at TED Talks and blogs and researching what other people are doing, getting into discussion groups and so on, this can really help to boost your motivation. So I'll leave it there. Um, as I said before, uh, I'm a career consultant working, specializing with PhD students and postdocs. And if you want to contact me or link with me in any way, I've left my details there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for that presentation. And now we're going to go into the live Q&A session. Uh, we'll see you there. Uh, hi everyone, 
Uh, I hope you can hear me okay, and thanks so much for sitting and listening to those series of talks. Um, we're now going into our live Q&A session, and I'm very pleased to see that we have some questions that we can run through. First of all, can I just check with Melina, Atma, and Sarah? Are you all there and with us and happy to chat? Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining, and thanks for your presentations. Um, so I'll kick off um, with a quick question, uh, which comes from a few people as you were, as, as we were watching your presentations from Sirius and Natalie, among others. Um, it's broadly around staying motivated on things that are potentially less fun. Um, you know, it's quite easy to stay motivated on the interesting things. I know, uh, certainly in my job, this kind of stuff um, is a little bit more entertaining than editing pages and pages of copy. Um, and I wondered if you had any particular techniques for staying motivated for things that aren't necessarily uh, the most stimulating day to day uh, as you as you stay at home. Um, I'll go to uh, Melina first for that one, if that's okay with you, Melina. Sure. Um, so for me, one of the tasks that it's extremely unmotivated, it's um, writing. Um, so now I'm in the process of writing my thesis and it's... It, it's really hard because it involves just reading and writing. So I have been using a technique that uh, others might also find useful. It's called uh, the Pomodoro technique. So basically, um, during this process, you set a timer for half an hour, and then once this half an hour is done, you can have a five minutes break. And I found this very useful because I don't feel that I need to sit down and ride for eight hours and I have regular um, breaks as well. So I think that it's a good approach in order to start working on tasks that you really don't want to because you have just a certain amount of time. You feel that you have to be working for just half an hour and then foot is done and you can take your break. So I think that this technique could be of some use for those that they really have to go into something that they don't want to. Superb. Thanks, Melina. Um, Atma and Sarah, would you would you add anything there specifically on getting staying motivated on tasks that aren't necessarily the most fun? I would agree with Melina. I think for me, getting started is usually the hardest part. So if I have a scheduled chunk of time, even if it's half an hour, where I say I have to start this and I have to work on this, then I know that even if I get nothing done in that time, at least I sat down and I got started and usually that will sometimes send me off to actually doing work. So nothing to add. I just wanted to say Pomodoro also works quite well for me. Thank you. Yeah, I've never heard of the Pomodoro, um, but I, I have an old fashioned diary and I put things in my diary and I schedule them as if they were a meeting and it makes me feel obliged to do things. So that can be quite compelling as well. Superb. Thanks very much, um, all of you. I'll move on to the next question. If anyone watching does have a question, um, please do feel free to share it. You just need to go to the Ask a Question box somewhere in this web page, um, type in your question and click Submit, and it will come up here. Um, I'm trying to look through your questions and uh, pick sort of common threads so we answer as many as possible in the time we have available. Um, this one comes in from Abdurrahman. Um, he asked about switching between work and rest. So getting into a good habit of um, kind of commuting from a, uh, a working state to a home state and vice versa, which I think is something, something a lot of people struggle with when they work from home. Um, I wonder if any of you have any advice. Maybe I'll, I'll, Sarah, can I put you on the spot if you've got any particular advice about commuting to and from uh, your own home? Yeah, I mean, basically, I enough, I've got a work space. I use and so when I'm in here in the office, you know, I shut the door and I am working. I don't have any other distractions. I think even if you're working on the sofa or anywhere you're working, just designate that as your workspace and don't try not to use it for anything else. And um, I think having a routine, um, you know, to, to get your sleep patterns regular is really important as well. I mean, you know, you don't want to be kind of half sleeping through the day and, um, you know, changing, uh, emerging work and rest 
together. So try to think back to what your pattern of work was before and, you know, just try to adhere to that as much as you possibly can. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Atma and Melina, do you have any other sort of thoughts around that? Um, I, I would like, sorry, go ahead. That's all right. I was just going to say, I also have a work playlist that I tend to play whenever I want to start working and I don't listen to those songs anywhere else. So I know when I start putting that playlist on, that's my time to start working. Melina? Uh, for me, um, what I've noticed is that uh, while I have been working from home, I have constantly my phone on my hand checking emails, Slack, etc. So um, I made an agreement, a pact with myself and my partner. After 5 p.m., I don't look at anything. Because it's, it's really easy because everyone expects that, oh, she can reply to an email, oh, she can see the speaker, etc. Everyone expects that the work will be sort of uh, spread throughout the day. So I think it's really important, as Atma said, to have cues. Even if it's a song, it's the timer, it's your clock. To say, okay, I've, I've worked for today. Great, thank you all. Um, that's perfect. Um, I, I'm just looking at the questions coming in now, and I, I think a few things that have been uh, mentioned is is kind of how we should feel about productivity during this unique time. I guess it's a slightly philosophical question, but. Um, a few people are mentioning, uh, you know, potentially pressure from supervisors or or from a wider world of science to be especially productive um, during this time. Do, do you guys feel that this is the time to be really busy, um, or is this a time to sort of accept what we might get less done? I'm, I'll go for I'll go to Atma first. If that's all right, Atma. Sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. Um, I am of the belief that this is not a time we should be especially productive. There's a worldwide pandemic going on. I think it's not realistic to think that even if we came into this thinking that we're working at home now, we have a lot more free time. Realistically, it's a really uncertain time and we have a lot of other things in our mind. There may be specific tasks we want to get done, but I just don't think it's realistic that we're all going to be writing papers in the next year, I think. We need to focus on specific tasks we can get done and just be inspired when we see other people are doing things or, yeah, just cope with what we can do instead of expecting to do too much. Because I think for myself, that expectation that I should be doing a lot right now was one of the main struggles I had in the first few weeks. And now that I know that, now that I focus on specific things, I'm getting more done rather than trying to focus on everything. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks for that. Um, and and I, I suppose a follow up to that. I, I suppose you know it's easily said that this isn't the time to be productive, and I I, I certainly agree that it isn't. Um, but you know your supervisor and, and other people might not necessarily feel the same. And I wondered if there's any uh, advice, maybe Sarah, you might have for for managing up, for communicating with your colleagues effectively, um, and you know letting them know that you might not be able to to be quite as productive and, and how, you know, how you should handle that conversation. Yeah, I, I've been reading things online, you know, during this uh, lockdown period, and there's been some great blogs um, from academics who are, you know, open-minded and, you know, understand that this is a difficult time and it's all about communication in the end. And it's great if they fire up those conversations. It's great if they take the initiative about it all. Because obviously, you know, what at my, what you were saying about your um, supervisors turning up as a potato, I mean, that's just fantastic, isn't it? Because it kind of shows you that, you know, that life isn't just all about, you know, getting work done and, you know, being a bit more easy going about the, the situation. Um, it's harder for you, I mean, especially if you're a PhD student, to actually take the initiative on this. But I would say uh, communication is the key uh, to all of this, and to share your experiences and to talk to other people, and then maybe approach or delegate somebody to approach the, um, the supervisor. Great, thank you uh, so much. Um, I'll move on to the next question now. Um, 
Raquel, I think it is, asks after um, you know the last year of your PhD and how you should maybe handle um, that and what you should think, uh, how you should approach the last year of PhD when you're writing up your thesis and that kind of thing. Um, Sarah, do you mind if I go for you again? Is that all right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's going to be really concerning, isn't it, that, um, you know, you are in the final year of your PhD, and I know that some funding bodies have been kind enough to give PhD students um, six months of funding uh, to carry them through. You are going to have to rethink your timeline, and you are going to have to rethink what is possible, and that definitely needs to be talked about with your supervisor. Yeah, this is a worldwide thing that's happening. It's not like that fire that I spoke about in someone's apartment or an illness that's happening just to one person. So there will be empathy and there will be understanding about this. I think in terms of looking at your career, um, you must just really do what you would normally do. Um, the kind of research you might want to do to investigate your career and what uh, kind of preparations you want to make for it. I know there's a lot of doom and gloom around about, you know, people aren't hiring and, you know, jobs are being frozen and so on. Um, we've had recessions before. This is a completely different situation. But we will weather the storm. To be highly uh, skilled and specialised as you are, um, it will be important for you to really think about where your strengths lie and how you're going to um, present yourself. And that's, that's a, quite a big obviously it's a big area um, but you know just making a start on that while you're in lockdown doing some research online uh, linking with people and networking will be really really productive great thank you so much um I've got a question here. In fact, we've got quite a few questions from various different people um, around anxiety and sort of dealing with your um, uh, with your mental health during this time. Um, particularly sort of combating work and feeling anxious about work and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, Melina, I know that's something that you mentioned in your talk. I wondered if you had any particular advice around um, uh, combating anxiety and, and finding a sort of healthy mental state with your work. Uh, sure. So um, as, as I mentioned, I'm personally suffering from uh, chronic stress and anxiety. Um, the, my first suggestion is to... Uh, to communicate with your colleagues, talk with them, share your goals, share your expectations, try to find allies in this journey. Um, and you can always address university services for more help if you think that it's something that you cannot handle anymore. Um, uh, I also believe that, and I hope that um, you will find empathy and a lot of uh, opportunities for communication or advisor as I found, for example. And uh, it's something that you, if you feel that all these emotions are just building up, you should not, people should not ignore that. Um, because, for example, for me at the beginning, I was just thinking, oh, I am weak, it's fine, it's just a bad day. But um, mental health is really important. And it's a, if you have good mental health, it will have a stronger and better foundation in order to build the rest of your life upon it. And I would say, as Atma said, that this is not the time to be extremely productive, etc. So I would suggest to those that are struggling to try to invest in themselves. Um, and uh, the productivity is not only measured as to how many papers you've written or how many papers you read. There are so many ways to measure productivity. So it's not necessary that if you don't do lab-related work, you're not productive. Great. So there are a lot of things to be considered. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that answer. Uh, Atma and Sarah, do you have anything else you would add um, around dealing with sort of anxiety for around around work? I think that personally, I also find that my anxiety gets worse when I think when I don't talk about it, and when I think that I'm just very isolated and I'm the only one going through this. 
Um, I think talking about it and even just watching other scientists talk about it on Twitter or anywhere has really helped me to realize that I'm not the only one going through this. We're all going through, through the same thing right now. And just seeing the different ways that people are adapting or coping with it has helped me. Um, even if some of the methods don't work for me, trying them out has really helped. Thank you. So just uh, just experiment, I suppose. Yeah. Like a scientist. That's what I've been yeah. Superb. Uh, Sarah, is there anything you'd add on, on that? No, I think that covers everything. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll run through a couple more questions. We're we're just running out of time, sadly, but I've uh, I've got a couple of spaces. Um, one question that's come in quite a lot is around uh, managing work and your time around a family or other sort of home responsibilities. Um, and I wondered if you, you could, any of you could share any thoughts around that, about you know, not getting under each other's toes or um, making sure to sort of support each other and not be in each other's way too much. Um, I know my housemate has tried to sneak into the kitchen as I've been presenting here and I've had to kick him out. Um, so I wondered if there's any, any other tips for that uh, i'll start with you melina if that's all right thank sure. you um so my partner and i both have been working from home so the first thing we did was to separate the apartment it's not a big one but we did this and we made sure that when we were in our work spaces um we wouldn't disturb each other but I understand, and a lot of my friends that are PhDs or postdocs and have kids, uh, this is more difficult because it's not very easy to say to a five years old, okay, I'm working now. You were not supposed to bother me. <laughs> um, so for that, I, I guess that um, it, there, there, there must be a few things that can be done between partners, but who's going to take care each time um, the kids need. Um, I don't have any personal experience for that, but what helped me was to really set a designated workspace and stay there and not bother my partner or my partner would bother me if I would be there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Atma, can I move on to you? I wonder if you had any advice about... Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so for me... I guess I tried a similar thing um, the first few weeks where I would say, okay, nine to five are my normal work hours. Let's try to keep them as my work hours and I'll just be working from home instead. So I'll keep my phone on silent and minimize talking to people on Messenger or um, going out and doing things apart from like a lunch break. That didn't work for me personally. Um, I think actually relaxing some of those restrictions has helped me where one of the i think someone asked this but one of the unanticipated positives of working from home is having a bit more flexibility so i'm using that time to sometimes if i know that i need a break or i'm just not mentally ready to work for one day i will take that time to go for a walk or a hike during the day and sometimes work in the evening instead um i think yeah for me it's worked better if I don't have a strict nine to five schedule, but definitely for my work chunks, wherever they might be in the day, minimizing distractions like phone and email has helped. And then it just depends on when the day I'll be doing those work chunks. Superb. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Right. I, I think we have time for one more quick question. I'm going to end in a sort of nice positive one and I'll start with you, Sarah, if that's all right. Um, we're only unanticipated positives to working from home? Is there anything that you've particularly enjoyed or has been nice about this, um, about being forced at home whilst you're working? Um, I work from home anyway, um, so it hasn't really been a big change for me. I like working from home and I find that things are much more under my control. Um, I've set up networks for myself, so although I'm not really interacting physically with colleagues, i found ways to do this online. I've set up a network of people that I can get in touch with. We have sites and zooming things every now and again, not too much. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I see articles, and I kind of, uh, you know, 
seeing the main sense who people that way. And so I like the idea of being able to just, you know, come and go as I please and uh, if I feel like lunch, I just pop into the kitchen and so on. So I think, um, yeah, set a structure for yourself as that much says, you know, don't be hard on yourself. You know, just be flexible and go with the flow because if you're out of your comfort zone, if this isn't something you normally do, um, you know, you have to kind of work your way into it. You know, it feels like you've been in this situation for ages, but it's actually only been two months. So, you know, don't worry if you're not really coping that well. And hopefully some of the suggestions today have helped people. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Melina, can I move on to you for um, uh, any thoughts about any positives from working at home? So, um, as I mentioned in my talk, I managed to finally work out a bit. <laughs> um, yeah. so that, was, that, was, that was huge for me. And uh, actually, like Atma said, I am embracing all the flexibility that work from home is. And what I am doing, I'm splitting my work day and in the middle I'm doing a bit of exercise. And it's really refreshing because I am managing to work out, release some stress, and then with a more clear mind, I go back to work. So for me, that was, I, I never thought that if I was able to work out so often, for example. So that was really positive for me. Superb. Thank you. And Atma, can we finish your year? Is there any, any particular positives you can take from, from this experience? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the main positive for me is that I'm actually in touch with family and friends from back home more now than I used to be, just because being at home, you do you can set your own hours. So with a 16-hour time difference between here and Australia, that makes it a lot easier to find overlapping hours where one of us is not working. Um, also, in terms of my own apartment, I moved in here like about a few months ago and I didn't have much furniture in here because I'd moved out of a place with my roommate. I've actually got furniture now and I have a work set up. I have a desk, which is great. <laughs> so just little things like that have really helped me when just, just step back and look at the positives, the flexibility. I can cook more now if I want to. I haven't been doing that too much, but it is nice to be able to cook your own lunches every day. So little things like that have helped me. Superb. Thank you. And I, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, point to end on, I, particularly because I think, Sarah, your dinner is arriving um, soon, I think you mentioned. Um, so that's great. So thank you, speakers, um, for coming and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we all really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for asking questions um, via that question box. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question, but I hope you nevertheless got some valuable um uh, lessons from this webcast and we're hoping to run more in the future so please do stay tuned for that um thanks everyone for for joining and wherever you are enjoy the rest of your day thank you thank you thank you thank you cheers